One. Good evening, Endurance School, and welcome to Detention, where you think about what you've done. Today, we're lucky to have Jacob Rathy, professional cyclist, bike fitter, and entrepreneur here with us. Jacob has raced professionally since 2010, landing on the podium of the USA National Road Cycling Championships in 2018, taking third place at the inaugural Steamboat Gravel event in 2019, and third at the under-23 Paris-Roubaix. He just finished Unbound Gravel 200 in 12 hours and two minutes, securing 24th place overall. He spent most of his career with the iconic U.S. domestic pro team Jelly Belly, powered by Maxis. Way more than just a bike racer, of course, Jacob also helped usher the innovative auto lock into existence, a lock that is actually secure, but light enough to take with you on any kind of bike ride. You will see them loop through the saddle rails of serious cyclists everywhere. He's also a bike fitter and a coach. These days, Jacob competes professionally in gravel races and helps 16 athletes get faster and more comfortable through his company, Rathy Athletic Development, or just RAD. Uh, we are very excited that he did something bad enough to land him in detention this afternoon. So Jacob Rathy, welcome to detention. Ooh, whatever, uh, whatever right happened to your audio has, uh, has done gone right when you were saying. So everybody, Jacob just said that he's really happy to be here in detention. Um, he wasn't saying, screw you guys. I don't belong. I, I shouldn't <laughs> I be here I never did anything detention. wrong. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. There are so many innocent people in detention. <laughs> hmm. Mm, nope. Still quiet. This happens to us all the time when our, our Zoom meetings um, try to tell us, try to switch our microphones to speakers, um, which uh, might be the thing that's happening. Um, still doing the same thing. Um, try opening up your Zoom preferences and go to the audio there and make sure that the microphone is the okay. Hey. Yeah, there we How go. How about now? Yes, you're back. Yeah. Okay. You're back. Yes. Advanced settings. Jake Look to the advanced settings. Oh, nice. Jacob Rathy, <laughs> welcome to detention. I'm here. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, that is a, uh, yeah, no, that was a, that, that was actually a very on-brand intro, so don't worry yeah, about that. Yeah, that's perfect. That's, that's what happens here all the time. So um, so first question, this is what we kick the stream off with every time. Uh, is this your first time in detention, Jacob? Uh, in this show, yes. <laughs> and I think in detention overall, I mean, probably, I think I was bike riding after school mostly. Huh, okay, okay. In middle school, I don't know about middle school, it's a little fuzzy, probably. Yeah, yeah all that. Um, all, all the all those drugs you were doing in middle school hard to <laughs> right <laughs> hard to remember <laughs> yeah it was cloudy. this might be my first time okay that's yeah. uh also on brand um molly and i have discovered that um the rest of the athletic community is very different than we were very uh, clean cut. and uh, very clean cut very well okay. behaved okay well so, i want to hear more about that another uh, time <laughs> uh, yeah, we can. Uh, I, well, short answer, I spent 45 days in seventh grade in detention and Molly, some uh, amazing number. Her they had to year change the, the rule in my in my high school in my senior year because I had more detentions than there were days of school. And you used to only be able to serve one detention per day. So because of me, the Molly Balfour rule, you're able to stack detentions now at Nary's Hall Girls School. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You're welcome, everyone. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but since then, we've gotten a whole lot more clean cut. Um, and Chris and I have been uh, doing this, as we've been talking about. This is kind of our pandemic project. Um, as we've been stuck at home for the last, you know, year and a half or so, um, this, has been, this has been kind of what we've cooked up. Can you let us know a little bit about what your time has looked like? Like, what has this made, um, made possible for you that you wouldn't have been able to do otherwise? Oh, man. Um, yeah, so last year, like, I think, you know, it was probably time for like a rest, a rest year uh, from the bike and like a really big periodized schedule, you know, like every like 15 years, maybe. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of what I did. Um, you know, I still rode for fun. I did 
I don't know, whatever it was, whatever I felt like doing, but definitely not uh, training and uh, a lot of, a lot of work on the house, just projects that I, you normally wouldn't uh, just get bored and do. Right. I just tearing the art apart and, and other stuff. So I was definitely busy. Yeah. I learned a lot and uh, it was nice for a while, but I think, yeah, I think I'm excited to get, get out of the house and, out of town and all that other stuff. Here you so. go. What, um, you, you just said you learned a lot this past year. What is, uh, what is the thing that you're most proud of learning? <laughs> oh, and home improvement stuff? Yeah, or just... sure. Any, anything. <laughs> oh, just like, um, just everything my dad did as a kid and now I just like, I'm trying to do the same, the same stuff and I call him and it's just like, Oh yeah, just, you know, you know, a combination of that and YouTube. Right. Mm -hmm. And you can pretty much do anything. So little, whatever mild electrical work, you, you know, be careful or just, I built a sauna in the basement and, uh, yeah, landscaping, just like trying to get plants to grow like irrigation. I mean, it's, some fencing, you know, gates. It's kind of goes on. Painting, lots of painting. You um, learned. You learned a lot this past basically year. Basically, just just if you just try, you'll figure it out. <laughs> have you Ooh, really that's what I learned? <laughs> have you really grown that tool collection this year too? Then have you gotten a lot of? Oh yeah, new, yeah, oh, huge, hugely. Yeah. I mean, that's I don't. You just buy the tool. Same with bike stuff. And just buy the tools and just do it yourself. It's kind of the for almost everything. Yep. <laughs> um, that kind of uh, that kind of education of like just go for it and you'll figure it out usually comes with uh, some dramatic mishaps. Uh, have you had anything go wonderfully wrong in the past year? <laughs> um, I mean, just like going to home improvement stores. Like, I think I went, maybe one time I went four days, four times in a day, and. You know, other than that, whew, nothing that was too, too expensive. No, nothing like really catastrophic. Nice. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you didn't, didn't electrocute yourself. Um, that's a good one. That's um, a good one. Yeah. Um, wasted, definitely wasting time. Like you just, you just start, sometimes you just kind of start over, waste yeah. a little bit of time and a little money. That's just kind of pretty typical. Yeah, that's the that's the tuition you're paying. <laughs> <laughs> you're paying for the education. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, well, gosh, we could. Uh, yeah, we could definitely turn this into an episode <laughs> going, of, yeah. of this old house. But um, so, uh, yeah, you just uh, you just did Unbound Gravel 200, um, finishing in 12 hours and two minutes. Uh, you've had bad luck in Emporia before your first time at that race. Uh, tell us the story of this year. Uh, I had. I would just say average luck. So pretty typical experience. You know, I had a flat like 20 miles in, which I was hoping not to, but you know, fast group. I mean, there was like a pinball machine with those like rocks flying everywhere. It seemed like especially rocky this year, like compared to my memory of just like bouncing and like, you know, hitting my shin, you know, that hurts. <laughs> um, just like it just, fast straight kind of these rollers and i just hit something and flatted and it took a couple minutes to get going again it wasn't super straightforward so i mean yeah what do you what do you do then i maybe you should tell me because i <laughs> probably rode too hard and like tried to catch back up and i did and then i got dropped immediately again just because uh it started it got kind of hilly so you know, tried to settle in. I tried to uh, find a good group to ride with. That was tough. You know, really, I was just trying to get a like good bike riders to ride with at a good pace. Um, Cause there was a hundred and at that time, 70, 60 or 70 miles to go. So I just wasn't quite satisfied with uh, just settling in for the day by myself. Um, so yeah, it went okay. Um, there were riders that tried to race with the front as long as they could. And I saw them 
you know, on the side of the road, right? Um, whether they were barely pedaling or sitting on the side of the road, waiting for something to happen, I don't know what. Um, you know, and then, you know, just kind of like a range of things that can happen, but definitely a lot of people, you know, you think you can race through the first hundred and then maybe, you know, fight through the second hundred and it's just, it's very tough. It's a tough race. Like you can't just pedal your way through the second half, you know, there's steep climbs, lots of rocks, like, you know, if you're completely empty like you are normally after a hundred miles of hard racing it's just it's you know 90 95 degrees you know you can just kind of come to a stopping point basically or <clears throat> 10 mile an hour average speed which is a tough place to be at so yeah totally yeah i kind of trucked through the the second half and whew, it's uh it's it it's as long as it seems <laughs> is what I'll say. It's very long and the last 50 miles are tough and the last 80 miles are tough. And it's, uh, I think more technical than people think like more steep climb, at least in the Northern, the route when it goes North of Emporia, it's just, uh, yeah, there's no directors. You can't just kind of draft your way through it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, <laughs> Yeah, that's like one of the things about gravel that you know is just like people think it's like racing and you're like no there's like a lot of resistance on the ground <laughs> oh yeah and it's I mean, we're talking soft like big rocks in yeah. this, the flint hills there so mm -hmm. it's something I, else <laughs> i heard i heard this year that it was rockier like everybody that i've talked to was like it seemed thicker i feel like everyone says that about a gravel race <laughs> But True. no, it was exceptionally rocky gravel. <laughs> what did you eat during the, the time that you spent out there? I ate more random things in the day that I spent, which was like not, I did half the distance that you did, but I ate more random things that day <laughs> than ever before. <laughs> um, I think for the most part, uh, just like kind of energy bars. I mm -hmm. think I probably had mostly scratch energy bars, a few like kind of, maybe a few Lara bars and then a lot of probably my uh, candy bar of choice was like a payday, like salty nice. peanuts. No chocolate. Um, payday. Chocolate. I really like like a Snickers bar, but it's, it's a melty. <laughs> you can't, it's, it's a mess. Yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, I had, I mean, just pretty much every salt sugar like everything i could kind of stomach and the the problem with the reason 200 miles gets way harder than even like 140 is just you just your appetite kind of just don't feel like eating anymore mm -hmm. and you just like you kind of like have to force it and you're like i just can't eat any more of this stuff or anything really so it's whatever you're kind of craving is kind of the, the answer basically yeah, absolutely. Um, and how lots of fluids. <laughs> every every fluid, right? <laughs> oh, I had salt stains everywhere, and then I laid in a creek because we crossed a creek, and it was just like that heat was kind of getting to me, and I was like, okay, I think we're only ten miles from the last aid station, and I think I I know I can make it, but I feel like we're on a down word trajectory like me physically and so i just so i was like no i need to, i laid in the creek fully totally submerged for like a minute and i was literally like up that next hill like my legs were like way better <laughs> you know just core temperature down and like just refresh and i was like okay that was good <laughs> that's what so. i should have done <laughs> done it yeah, so I just kind of reversed the trend a little bit. <laughs> and how have you been doing since then? How has your how's your recovery been going? You know, it was kind of uh, like one of those. It felt like I raced for like a week to recover from it. It was like a, it was like doing tour of California, or maybe I was more sore. Um, and then I hadn't really done anything during the week, and then I thought you know, with my wife and some friends, we thought it'd be a good idea to go for a hike. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a full cyclist, so I can hike without any problems usually. And then 
we decided to do like the hardest hike in the Portland area, which is Mount Defiance, which is 5,000 feet straight uphill <laughs> and like very steep. Ooh. So we, <laughs> so I'm, I guess it wasn't a good inter introductory hike, you know, ease, ease into the, ease into it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Come on coach. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I have the last couple of days had probably the worst soreness in every part of my leg than I've had in years. Yeah. Um, so that's a bike racer problem. I don't know if you guys really know about it. <laughs> no, I was gonna, I mean, like I, I, I think I, like down the downhill is a problem. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was going to ask you to expand on that where you said, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not a full bike racer in that way. I can, <laughs> I can hike. So I um, do, since I've done like backcountry skiing with a lot of hiking and skiing down, you know, like, you know, easily five or 6,000 feet of, of, uh, net elevation with a, with, you know, on skis. So there's not really the walking downhill, but there's still some impact and, and stuff. You know, I haven't had problems hiking, but there's something about, um, Mount Defiance. It's some, I mean, very steep trail and it just like I could barely walk. I actually couldn't walk down the stairs unassisted and it's, they're still pretty sore. So, um, I'm sore for the second week in a row. Oh nice. no. Good work. <laughs> it was almost like one day where I wasn't sore. So, um, yeah, it's just great. Really good recovery. You're going to have to yeah. go lay in the river. <laughs> <laughs> I need to. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it kind of was right there on the tin, Mount Defiance. <laughs> I mean, why, why do a normal hike when you can do the hardest one? Mm -hmm. There you go. That's mm -hmm. the, uh, after that, unbound. <laughs> that's the man who's won Oregon skulls. Is that the name of that race or is it Oregon skulls? Is that the name of it? Skull and 20. That's right. The, yeah. Yeah. We will talk about that one a little later. Oh, boy. Okay. A couple, a couple friends were like, we signed up for this race in Eastern Oregon skull mm -hmm. something. Sweet. And I was like, Oh God, really? Awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so how do you, how do you evaluate, I mean, you have done all, so many races in your career, you know, stretching back over more than a decade now, how do you evaluate whether a result is a positive one or a negative one for you? Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I think there's things like, you know, in, in some races, like the worst thing would be like, if, you know, doing something like stupid, like making a, just making a mistake where maybe at the time you knew it was kind of wrong or you didn't act in the way you knew, like you didn't follow like instinct or you just kind of like, you didn't, you know, kind of go for it. Right. Um, so, you know, there's definitely days where I was like, you know, like, Oh, that was so stupid. What was I thinking? Um, so that's a bad result, no matter what the result is really, you know, it's like, Oh, I, it wasn't, that was just me thinking about something like too much or like not acting, you know, with confidence. Um, so yeah, I think, I think when I found a good spot, like in competing was just kind of like doing, you know, just going to kind of the basics of like, I'm going to just going to do like the best I can and like, you know, be able to make decisions well, like throughout the race. And then, yeah, it's like, if I do all that, then if someone's like stronger or better, I mean, that's just like not really anything to worry about. You know, if you're just physically beat, you know, I'm not, there's nothing to really regret in that regard. Um, so yeah, I would say like results based, like, was it, did I have good, like, did I set myself up to do well and did, <clears throat> you know, did I do the best I can and was I like in the position to win? Like, did I let anything, you know, and bike racing is probably more of a problem, like, than just like, like decision-making, but, uh, yeah, like if I, if someone just beats you, there's nothing really to regret. Right. And so I like, you know, just kind of doing the best you can. And that's just kind of something to be kind of proud of, or, you know, if you got dropped when you shouldn't have, like if you could have made it a little further, you know, that's, that's not a good feeling. Um, so yeah, on, you know, certain days when I had a goal, I just, the, you know, the goal would be to finish without any type of like, oh, I should have done this or that. Right. 
And so I think I could race pretty smart if that was kind of like the mindset. Um, not really being afraid of losing or anything. That's kind of a, yeah, bad way to kind of race. So. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, do, you, do you feel like your experience as a coach has informed the way that you race? Do you, are you able to like draw on that while you're racing? Um, I haven't done much racing since I've been coaching. <laughs> I mean, it's been like, I guess probably like three years when I just started coaching. Um, but yeah, I like to think about, you know, each rider and like their kind of how they can be successful and just kind of how, you know, I wasn't necessarily good at anything on the bike, right? I wasn't, you know, there's say there's broad categories of like sprinter, climber, time trialist, but then a lot of successful bike riders aren't really the best at any of those, right? So they kind of find like a, a way to be successful, you know, whether it's a type of racing or a <clears throat> specific approach to a type of racing, you know, it gets pretty specific. Um, but, you know, there's some fundamentals um, just in like overall bike racing skills, you know, being able to sprint, even if you're a climber and being able to time trial, like if you're a sprinter and, you know, just there's so much overlap. So yeah, as a coach, you know, just like not getting, you know, at a, at just kind of a broader level, you know, there's just a lot of skills people can improve. That's just like makes you, you know, gets you in a better place in a bike race. Um, Cause it's, so unpredictable and random, you know, it's just like, <laughs> it's hard to make sense of like how to approach bike races, but I think, yeah, there's, there's some kind of tools you can use to make good decisions based off where you're at. And that's what I, yeah, try to help people with. Can you, can you give us an example of that uh, in terms of like working with an athlete? Because, you know, I think so many cyclists, like at first they want to like talk numbers, but then what you're talking about is like putting yourself in a position to be able to have success. So like, could you talk a little bit of, or give us an example of like how you have helped somebody um, do that? Um, sure. Yeah. So <clears throat> let's see here. Yeah. I mean, just general bike racing talk, you know, like going into a stage race, like how, you know, especially, you know, looking at, say there's a time trial, then there's like this GC and it's like, well, who's, you know, thinking about motivations of other riders. Right. So that would be kind of the first step. Like how would, how would I act if I were these people and what are they going to do? Um, and just trying to find like, one thing is like synergy. Like if someone's trying to ride GC, they're a good person to try to, if I want to win the stage, they're kind of like a good person to, to ride with right because their motivation we can both kind of win you know we can both accomplish the goal um and so you know maybe this if this person is active they'd be like a really good person to be around um or maybe there's a few people like that so um yeah and then just taking like uh you know if meeting like just being like good enough at some things and then really like working on skills like you know here's here's the physical requirement for this race and i think if you could make that group you know you'll be like the fastest guy um so yeah it's like uh you know but then there's just like everything you know break like riding in a breakaway like right you know you just like don't pull too much <laughs> you know it's like ride as slow as possible is really the idea um and just you know be learning to look at the other riders you know think um, always be thinking basically. Um, so yeah, I was from, I liked my kind of upbringing in bikes cause I had, you know, when I was, it was kind of a turning point when I was, I think when I was maybe 18, there was one rider on the national team, like on one trip, I remember there was one rider with a power meter. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> so before that, it was just, you know, a lot more like kind of bike racing was the focus and then it you know it kind of veered into power stuff so you know there's definitely bike racing fundamentals and that's what i yeah i like that a lot you know as well as power um so yeah definitely a different 
there's I feel like my our age was like on that cutoff really. Um, so yeah, totally. So you as a as a racer, you have kind of shifted focus in the last three years to gravel primarily. Um, what has led to that uh, that that change? What led you to to move away from road racing as much? Um, is there something about gravel that drew you there? Or how did that decision happen? Um, yeah, I guess on in uh, road racing, there was just there wasn't anything in it really for me anymore. And in, in terms of like I had kind of done the races domestically like too many times uh did run redland seven times you know <laughs> and it's like you know there's just like not much developed you know i wasn't getting much out of that it's just kind of like the things that were put in front of me didn't really get me that excited to like train or race and it was just like you know kind of time not to do that anymore you know unless i was going to go to the really the next level but you know it's kind of like a thing where like yeah it's either the next level or or not so uh yeah i mean gravel i wouldn't say it's like the same as it's not the same level as road like i'm not approaching it with the same level and that's not really the idea so yeah gravel and uh, mountain biking um and even cyclocross um you know stuff on the dirt i guess it's uh that was just kind of got me excited to you know race and train and it's not uh i don't know how many days on the road i was spending you know could have been like a hundred or something and uh yeah it was just stuff that i thought would be a new challenge and it could also do focus on other things besides that so yeah, I felt like I was just kind of, it'd run its course. And yeah, I just like still still competing and being in the um, competitive kind of area and probably should, you know, train a little more, but, you know, a little, little better. <laughs> but uh, there's um, still like some residual fitness, right? That's just kind of, after all that road racing is just kind of, easy to access at this point, but it won't be forever. Um, so really similar to triathlon, like the gap between the amateur ranks and the professional ranks, like looks really small. Like it looks pretty, like it looks easy to cross, but it's actually like, it's pretty big. Um, what is one of like, what's a misconception about professional cycling that you hear from even like high level amateur cyclists a lot? Hmm. Um, yeah, so yeah, like a cat one is not a pro and then the, the pros are not all like full time, like that's not their job necessarily. And if, if every level gets way harder, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I think the, I mean, in, in terms of power stuff, I mean, the, the, the pro racing is like it's faster for longer right so you're at you're at mock speed like for most of the race right and then it goes faster there's just so much like horsepower in those you know world tour races or even you know a step down from there um so probably a misconception is yeah i guess i don't really have a specific misconception but you know just like you know the doing one effort, like one Strava segment as fast as a pro does not mean you'll be beating him or, you know, or them after five, after a hundred miles, right? <laughs> At 300 watt normalized power, basically, like sitting in the bunch <laughs> or 320 or something, <laughs> you know? So uh, that's probably the, the difference really is just like, oh, we're going to, do all this work and then it's time to race. So right. in you, positioning. <laughs> yeah. Tell us about yeah. that. Yeah. I okay. know. Yeah. Uh, being in position to race at the front of the race is a whole race in itself. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, that is, that's really where the next level takes off is like, even like 
going into a climb at the end or even the second to last climb. I mean, everyone wants to be there and you're doing a field sprint into the climb and then someone's going to ride really hard on that climb for the first two to five minutes and then it settles in. So, I mean, you're not resting going into that climb and it's, you're, you know, similar to getting top 10 in a field sprint at lower levels would be just being in position, right? So, you know, they're going fast. <laughs> yeah. How, how did you, how, how did you adjust to that? Like how, how did you develop that skill? Um, yeah, I mean, I was probably, I like doing like the classic races. So like Tour of Flanders and Roubaix and those are, you know, another notch above like the climbing races, like in, in one regard, um, you know, you can't really use power to move up, you know, if you're in the middle of the, of the pack, right. On the cobbles, so like you're just, you're 500 meters behind the front at that point. Um, you know, uh, America, so yeah, American riders go over there and they're, they're strong. So we do good in the time trial. And then, you know, at least back then, you know, we had trouble in these big Pelotons, right? Cause the Belgian European kids, especially the Belgians, they could be in 200 rider fields at age 12. <laughs> right. So, and then you go over there and it's just like, Oh, we're, we're not going to ride this far apart. We're going to ride like this far apart and we're going to go fast. And if you leave a gap, like the wheel's gone, like you're going to be at the back before long. So yeah, that's stuff to learn. And it's just comfort zone and it's terrifying. And at, at a certain point you just kind of get used to it and you just, it's, you establish confidence with, with the good riders, like over there, you can lean into someone and just kind of squirm your way through. And that's, that's not going to work out in Oregon, right? You're going to, people aren't going to be happy. <laughs> so yeah, there's just crashes do definitely happen, but it's at a, such a higher level that you just, you, you trust the other riders more as well. Um, and maybe as an American, you really have to earn their trust at first. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely scary at first and it's, everyone's got to kind of find your way through those pack, through those Pelotons. It's yeah. <laughs> so you rode, um, you raced at the world tour level for two seasons, um, first with Garmin Barracuda and then Garmin Sharp. Uh, what, what else, I guess, about racing at that level was, um, was different from your expectations or how did it, how did it compare to what you expected? Um, yeah, I mean, that was, yeah, a while ago, but, um, just thinking about at that point, it was just like meeting, like basically racing with and, even like rooming with, like being on a team with riders that I had watched like my whole career, basically my whole life. <laughs> right. And I, I wasn't like a huge cycling fan as a young, when I was younger, but you know, just like being in a like team with like Christian Vandeveld, right. Or like, you know, the Zabriskie and David Miller and those guys that were kind of finishing their career at that time. Um, yeah. And just kind of like learning from them. Cause I was just, basically insane at, at the time. <laughs> um, so yeah, th you know, they're just normal guys, right? I guess that's the surprising part. And they, you know, they train and they just like, they go over there and, and yeah, world tour, it's a lot of good riders there. And it's like, there's not a single race that's like easy to win. Right. There's just every single person that wins a race at that level is just like you know even stuff you haven't even heard of you know it's a it's it's hard and there's 10 other guys there's going to be lots of other riders like just depth in that field that are also trying really hard to win and there's you can't look at one person like to be there's like 20 <laughs> so um if you were to be able to talk to yourself in 2009 2010 what piece of advice would you give that chick <laughs> I would have a lot of stuff to say. 
Um, What's the one biggest thing that you would suggest? I would probably tell him to do more skiing. <laughs> For real, yeah. I'd, uh, more like cross training in the winter, like maybe it's skate skiing or even just downhill skiing, like do more hiking, you know, work on uh, stuff that I kind of work with people on bikes fit now, just like having a more like better, like functional movement and not being on that, like the, the next race is the most important thing, but like just, you know, getting good mechanics from an early age and like spending time like with someone that is skilled and you're not just like one appointment oh do this and then never doing any of it right um until there's a problem um yeah probably just just slowing down a little bit in terms of uh yeah just taking taking care of myself probably a little better yeah i, I uh I, I, I resemble that statement as well. <laughs> I would I would like to plus one on that one. <laughs> so I need to know a little bit more about this game because I hear that you are responsible for Chris Bagg's uh, entry into uh, American Berkabiner. So what role has uh, has cross country skiing played in your life? Yeah, well, I started doing it in. Uh, I think it must have been around maybe 2016 and it was just kind of like it was a cross training thing that i do in winter and you know i had a lot of these like pt exercises to do because i was you know body was like in shambles at that point um so i was like you know actually skiing is like this is like the same this is actually really beneficial and it's like the right kind of like energy burn rate basically and uh so yeah, I had a friend just actually just met, uh, yeah, Harrison, if you need a ski coach, ski coach, Harrison Harb, or you, Molly, that's right. Um, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Very serious. <laughs> but uh, he basically just taught me how to ski, and I think I may only went like four times, but then I just was like, okay, I like this, I'm up in the snow, it's like, it's not a rainy valley, I'm like, I can escape, I can work on this, and uh I just kind of got a little carried away and I did some races and I mean, this is a challenging skate skiing is a very challenging sport. I think it's maybe comparable to swimming from what I've heard in terms of like how technique is how important technique is and in, in like going fast, um, over like just pure, like physical ability. Um, so yeah, I did some races like a Mount hood and it would be like, I don't know. There could be someone that, I don't know, 60 years old, you know, people that are like not really training anymore. <laughs> um, you know, at the same similar level in skiing and then uh, just kind of took it from there and went to the American Burke Biner because there's a Norwegian version like the original and now the American ones in Wisconsin. And it is just an absolutely just, crazy ski event with 10,000 participants, I think, in a normal year and just fans along the course, you know, 50 kilometers. And it's just a really fun time. And it's just kind of how endurance sports should be, you know, with just like the world-class skiers in the front and then all these other people trying to finish or race themselves or their buddy or whatever. And I was like, all right, this is, uh, this is, I'm a, I'm a grand Fondo skier and I love it. <laughs> um, we'll come back to skiing a little bit, I think, but, uh, I want to make sure we talk about some of your other stuff that you do. Um, so you've had a, a real hand in developing and then launching auto lock, which, uh, I've got one, all of my friends have one, uh, it's a really, <laughs> a, a really, really handy, uh, device. What, what was your role in developing Autolock and then also in like getting it out into the world? Um, so yeah, around 2013, I, I don't know what really happened, but I was just riding and it, it did come pretty suddenly and just like seeing people like with the whole cafe stop that, you know, whatever mid ride stop basically. And just everyone's kind of like 
has their little trick for like, oh, no one will steal my bike. I'll like put it in the biggest gear or like I'll put mine on the bottom and like whoever's bike, uh, you know, the bottom of the stack or like I'll use my helmet or something, right? So, you know, and there was nothing that I would take on a ride as, that was a bike lock. Um, so, yeah, it just, that just kind of created this exploration, like, well, what could this be? It's basically a bicycle accessory that I would take bike riding, um, kind of like my pumps on my bike. I have a saddlebag, but like this lock could live on this bike and it would just kind of be there whenever I needed it. Um, so then I kind of tinkered with that a little bit and um maybe i had a few little models made i was just kind of like playing around and then i met uh, jake vander sanden who was just then starting auto design works and he was like oh this is this is an interesting concept and he went through you know a few uh design like had an engineer kind of work on some potential designs and materials. And then like, then there was like focus groups and then those look good. And, you know, just starting to started this thing. Right. And I was just kind of there and like, okay, yeah, let's, <laughs> you know, not really executing the whole project, but you know, he had all the resources and like the company and the brand and he knows what he's doing. And honestly, at the, like, I wouldn't trust my, you know, it's, it's a, it's a big endeavor, anything with like tooling and hard goods and like, you know, I just, there's just no, like, I, if I was a bank, I wouldn't give myself money to, to <laughs> right. And so, you know, it just really wasn't an option to like, I was like, I have no idea what to do here, you know? So, but uh, yeah, so, you know, we've had a wild ride with just this kind of, portable bike lock it's like a quarter pound and it's basically the size and weight of a tube and it can it can uh be mounted to your bike we have a new bag that's actually coming out in like a week it's like a circular bag where the lock can fit in as well as like you know like your keys or like a wallet so more like an essentials bag like some valuables and like a little pocket for snacks so yeah it's just kind of like a tinkering thing <laughs> that's that's been uh yeah that's been great you had me a pocket for snacks <laughs> what um what hole in the market was auto lock designed to fill like what did you feel like was um, was missing about the existing options yeah i mean they're all for like commuting right or even just like heavy duty commuting or light commuting and you know there's really nothing i would there's nothing i would take on a hundred mile ride Right. So this is a lot of, like, yes, you'll take it on a century ride or whatever. Right. And in its weight, in its class of, of, of the locks you would take on a hundred mile ride, it is harder to break than any other lock that people, you know, would use in this scenario. Right. So it's not that, you know, every lock is breakable. I would say if you are looking at bike locks, I would be very careful about just leaving your bike out to begin with. Cause you know, there's just <clears throat> nothing, there's really nothing that can, you know, power tools are battery operated and are pretty good these days. And bike thieves just kind of walk up and steal them in broad daylight. And that's just, you know, but that's just what happens. Right. So yeah, you know, short, it's a, it's kind of like a lock for a bike ride for like when you're riding, like if you're wearing spandex, it's a good lock to use. If you're not wearing spandex, you might as well have a heavier lock. Um, and then it's just like, be careful with, even if you're at a dinner in, you know, the east side of Portland, just, I'd just be careful with your bike, you know, even and out somewhere, um, even with any lock really. So, um, yeah, I'd say it's like the, the spandex rule is probably the difference. I love it. <laughs> Clip in shoes, you know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think your, uh, your book, when you write your book, should be called The Spandex Rule. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I yeah. think that'll sell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then just everything that you have to say uh, will fit under The Spandex Rule. <laughs> right, okay. My book, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we all, we all do it at some point. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Speaking of, uh, you know, books and stuff like that, um, let's talk about coaching. Um, how did you get into it? 
I don't really know. Um, maybe put out one little feeler one time and I had a few people start and then just started this thing where I had three or four or five clients at a time of, you know, this is like, it was like top secret coaching, right? No one knew about it <laughs> uh, for a couple of years. And, you know, they would just kind of ask me and like, Oh, I hate, Oh, I heard you're doing this. Can you know? Yeah. Let's talk. And I was like, okay. And then, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I liked it actually. It's, it's, it's uh, I think there's some purpose and it's, helpful. And I think I've, you know, broad perspective on at least bike racing, um, and, and training. Um, and so, yeah, I think I, I'm basically educated in it <laughs> is one good reason. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I like it. So, um, yeah, I figured it would be, so when I started kind of my, I guess, company or it's just me. So, um, called Rathi Athlete Development. So I wanted something, you know, kind of every rider's kind of like at a stage of development. And if you're not, then, you know, maybe you should think about that, <laughs> rethink that. Um, so, yeah, I was like, well, you know, I think even no matter what I would do with like a career goal, I think this would be part of it. Um, yeah. So it's, it's fun. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, there's just, there's more training stuff online than ever before, but that can even make things more confusing. You know, it's just like swimming in information, really. So, um. <laughs> Take this brief moment to tell all of our watchers, do not YouTube swimming videos. <laughs> so much bad oh. information. <laughs> so much bad information. Okay, bad <laughs> swimming. Well, I can really not help you with swimming. Yeah. So. <laughs> I know how to swim, though. Ooh, interesting. I have to. <laughs> interesting. Yeah. So, what is a what is a mistake that you see athletes in the cycling world making that you would that you would like to correct, or what's one that um, that particularly irks you? Hmm. Um. Yeah, I mean, there's like some basic rules, right? <laughs> um, it's just like some of the a lot of training is just like i think people are actually kind of killing themselves like a little too hard usually like in the winter on a trainer you know when you get into like five days a week of intervals for like six weeks in a row you know they're just it's not that maybe it works for some people i don't really know but a lot of people are just like you know they're just kind of they're not ready for the next step after that. You know, they're just kind of flatlined for a long time. So I don't know. Um, yeah, just doing the same training every day, <laughs> like afraid to So I, I see the, the great thing about a coach is it's just kind of like permission to train and also permission to rest. Right. So, you know, if you're not really confident in training, you, you're like afraid, Oh, I can't train too hard or this or that. And so I'm, I'm afraid to push it, you know, but then you're also afraid to, to really rest and like whatever, lose fitness. So that's their, their thinking, not mine. So, yeah, I think just having confidence in, in, the, in a plan and, you know, being able to have, you know, being able to push yourself a little bit, you know, maybe you have some, you know, you feel tired and then, you know, being confident enough to rest and not, Feel like you're kind of trying to fill in or catch up or I don't know do whatever maybe there's a plan online maybe it's your own thing you know just not it, to me that's just like a low confident it's not a confident plan when you're you know you need something I think that coach can give someone kind of that direction to push and pull you know um how is your what how is your thinking about training changed since you became a coach? Um, well yeah, it's definitely, you know, broader, like, you know, finding a athlete, you know, like they're not all I can think about my each stage of my development, right? And kind of like, well, what was like, 
you know, what was the next step when I was here or, you know, the next step or, you know, different phases. Cause it's not really the same for everyone. Um, and so, yeah, just thinking, uh, taking any person, no matter where they are and just take putting like kind of putting them in the next, like wh wh where do we go from here? Like given their immediate history and like even longer history, like how do we challenge them the right amount to get to the spot? So yeah, sometimes that's difficult, you know, just thinking of people that are, you know, not everyone follows along my trajectory, but uh, yeah, just, um, so it's not super straightforward. <laughs> um, so yeah, just learning how to gauge efforts, right, for, for all types of people, really. Um, so yeah, and... love, that, love that answer. That's a good, uh, <laughs> I think that's, yeah, right. Like, like all coaches should, should wrestle with that question. How do you gauge your athletes efforts? Yeah. Or yeah. With low tech or high tech, you know, it can just, it's just, yeah, there's a lot out. There's a lot. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. What is a result that one of your athletes has had or an achievement that you're particularly proud of? Oh man, well we're we're pretty light on results and uh, recently <laughs> maybe unofficial. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, okay, let's go. Recently at uh, yeah at Tulsa Tough, um, I had two riders there in uh, the the Pro One race, and you know we're, this is like full on crit racing. I, I was watching it, and I felt like this is like the world series of just like you know like big deal like you know all the good all the good riders were there and you know it's the first pro crit you do or pro race you know it's not really like i wouldn't go into it i wouldn't tell anyone that i wouldn't expect them to like be winning or 10th place because it's just even just besides the physical aspect there's just a lot there's just a lot thrown at you at once um so yeah they hung in there good you know they finished the first two days and then uh you know the crybaby hill stage you know keelan you know it's very hard race and you know keelan was like in a little breakaway so you know just like entering the race and like engaging with the race right and so you know i thought that was like a good you know it's you just gotta get up to the front and you know, if you can get like off the front in those races, that's like really hard, <laughs> yeah. right? Because they're fast and there's like, you know, the positioning and you're not just like, you know, there's, it's, it's tough. So yeah, I think jumping up a level and just, you know, trying to participate is that's a good, you know, challenging kind of task there. So mm -hmm. that was cool. Yeah. Yeah. That is a, uh, I mean, there's that ladder of like bike race expertise, right. Where it's like complete a race and don't get dropped. You know? <laughs> like, like, like get into a breakaway, you know, and it just like goes up from there. And yeah. I know. Top 10, like right. see the, yeah. See the sprint, like yeah. be present. Right. Oh, that's how it worked. Right. So yeah. you, you, you do kind of have to check off each kind of, you know, level. In, in one way or another and then it just kind of makes a lot more sense um for the next time you know so what um what are you interested in as a coach you know i mean all of us as coaches like you know we like you read stuff you get exposed to stuff there's always new ways of doing things like where is your interest being pulled at the moment um in mm. terms of like professional development yeah, so that's in kind of two topics, and that's just, you know, more of uh, science stuff, right? So I have, like, a physiology textbook that I'm, like, reading, and I just, like, bought it. You know, I just, I think I think I can help communicate with people better and probably learn and definitely learn stuff, like, with some of this more, like, technical information of, like, just, like, energy and cells and, you know, aerobic conditioning and, you know, all this stuff. Um it's so, like, you know, I know I can improve in that regard and like, just like, yeah, have that just ironed out a little better. Um, yeah. And then I think the most intriguing thing is just like more like 
psychology really and especially in bike racing because it's such an intimidating sport and you don't really like it's hard to even have like it's it's not like a rational thought to like think i can beat all these people that are really good right so i think a lot of people get kind of stuck um <clears throat> in in bike racing just like you know they just kind of veer away from like i'm just gonna you know they, they, they look around too much they're looking at other people's training or rides or their wheels or whatever stuff that doesn't even matter um you know they just need to like get in the right headspace right so the right mindset and like try to keep their keep that part of the game like really consistent and yeah so that's I mean, yeah, I'm not even close there, but just talking to people like, okay, what are you, you know, like, what do you think, like, what are you thinking about at, at this time? You know, it's just like, that's like a dark hole of like, you know, there, there, there are like little mental tricks of like how to break down bike racing and the efforts and like really like hard physical exertion. Um, but yeah, that's just something I'm always trying to think about and learn. Cool. So the, uh, yeah, the physiological and the mental. Yeah. And like, Augustine. yeah, I know that the, a lot of good riders can like, they're just so good. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, they're almost like psychotic. They're just like, yep, I'm going to like just destroy, rip these people's legs off. It's just crazy. But I don't know. <laughs> so what does the rest of your race season look like? Where can we look out for you for the rest of the mm -hmm. year? I am uh, doing, I think, like the six hours of Mount Hood coming up in the High Cascade 100. And I think Steamboat. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, maybe some, yeah, Mount Tabor, maybe some other stuff. Uh, hopefully local. There's some local racing. I'd probably go to a road race if there was one. Um yeah, cyclocross, I think, yeah, I think I'm finding a good, yeah, in terms of like eight hour bike races, like one, one per month is good mm -hmm. for that, for eight hours. <laughs> As you get into the eight hour range, it's like, that's a good amount. Yeah, that's, yeah, I'm, eight hours is, triathlon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um yeah eight hours is like more than enough 12 hours you're like oh my god this 12 is... hours once per year yeah yeah exactly <laughs> maybe <laughs> you can always do um, the 100 <laughs> hey i'm i'm not i'm not against it <laughs> um and uh where can people find you where can we direct people to uh find out more about you and your bike fitting and your coaching services okay well on instagram just at jacob rathy just my name r-a-t-h-e <clears throat> and then uh, I have a coaching Instagram, Rathy Athlete Development. And then uh, bike fitting at Endurance PDX. So that's in just endurancepdx.com. That's in uh, Northeast Portland. And uh, I think that's about it. Uh, Try not to have too many handles. Do you have a website for Rathy Athletic Development? Yeah, it's just that.com. Perfect. Rathy athletic development.com. Sorry, everybody. it's ath athlete. Athlete <laughs> development. Rathy athlete development. It's the Rathy athletes are kind of an awkward. No, no, I no. Like it's it. good. You got some, uh, yeah, you got some good consonants in there. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're a fan. Um, but, uh, well, thank you so much for uh, spending an hour with us. It goes by. Wow, that was so an hour. Quick. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Um, we didn't All really right. get to talk about bike fitting, but everybody, uh, Jacob is a bike fitter. Um, you did the bike fit for my longtime sponsor, Brian Roddy from Rolf Prima recently. He said, he, oh, had, wow. he said he had a great time. Oh, uh, cool. So yeah, he was, he was really stoked. Um, but yeah, everybody, uh, go see Jacob for your coaching needs, your bike fitting needs. And, uh, yeah, um, always a good guy to go and have a coffee with. So thank you so much for, uh, hanging out in detention with us. And, uh, yeah, it's time to get on the late bus and, uh, head on home. Oh, finally. All right. <laughs> that was fun. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thank you. We'll talk to you again soon. Bye. Cheers. Good night. <laughs>